down the street from your hotel, baby. I stayed home with my disease. What up guys, just wanted to put a big freaky looking carrot on the screen to start off this video today. This is the Graffiti Carrot Man, some horrible carrot man fan, Vandal has, you know, gone to some wall somewhere and sprayed the Carrot Man tag all over the place. So yeah, um, the Graffiti Carrot Man is your mascot for today's video, which is Another episode of How to Master 6 Max Zoom, surprise, surprise. This is episode 12, it's going to be about barreling turns, and this is characters. The neighbours are shouting and screaming and like a kid is crying or something, and it's just like the usual shit. So, um, yeah, if you hear, I'll try and talk up so you don't have to hear like the degeneracy of this family um, that are next door, and hopefully you won't have to hear like horrible domestic um, uproar at 2pm on a Thursday, Friday afternoon, disturbing your video. So yeah, apologies if any of it filters through. Hopefully not. Hopefully you'll be too transfixed on the poker to really notice the three-year-old screaming for an hour. You can tell I'm like not a huge fan of the three-year-old. I'm not a fan of any three-year-olds to be honest. Like they're all pretty annoying, but this one in particular, um, yeah, you know, gotta blame the parents really, right? Anyway, Vacuum turn barrel factors is the first thing we're going to talk about today. We're going to start off in a vacuum and actually discuss what makes a hand good to barrel in a vacuum. So not considering how Hero should actually be playing his range. Just first of all thinking about what makes a spot good in isolation. In Zoom, I have warned you guys many times throughout this series about the dangers of playing hands solely in a vacuum. What it does to your long term EV, to your range, to your image, to your HUD stats as they show up on villain screen. Um... That's not to say, though, that it's completely useless to understand what makes something good about in a vacuum, because in order to flesh out our range and choose the best hand for the best role, we do indeed need to know what hand performs best in a vacuum in each kind of role, so that we can create the best balance strategy and not just a random balance strategy that's not very good and doesn't make much money, or no money. So then we're going to talk about what balance actually looks like on the turn, because balance is such a huge theme in a Zoom series, in this Zoom series anyway. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how do we create a balanced turn range, like what kind of frequencies of bluff to value do we need, what does that depend on, and how do we go about actually deciding whether we should take a hand and barrel it on the turn from a balanced perspective, so not just thinking, oh look this hand is good or bad to bet in a vacuum, so I'm going to do that, but actually thinking what kind of strategy do I want to play here, um, I want to play a balanced strategy, what does my range look like, and where am I in my range, and what bluff frequency would it equate to suitability wise if I actually bet this hand like how suitable is the hand to bluff and therefore if I bluff it how often am I bluffing you know based on how many better or worse more suitable or less suitable bluffs I'm using in that spot so sometimes the way we play our hand like if we decide to bluff with a hand that actually has repercussions to the range that we're playing because Obviously, we're going to bluff with the most suitable bluffs first and only then the lesser bluffs. That should be the way we construct our range for every action X. We want to do the hands that are best at X before we do hands that are less good at X when we're filling out the X part of our range, or the X sub-range, if you like. So when we're going to barrel the turn, we're always going to say, okay, um, what does this mean? Like, if I'm betting this 8-7 suited here with this open-end straight draw, how much of my range am I betting? Not necessarily that much. Okay, I can afford to bluff weaker hands here. That kind of thought process we're getting at today. Then we're going to do more live play because everyone loves a bit of live play in Zoom. It's just too convenient not to. And I just love like being able to cover random topics as well. I don't just want to be confined in this series to the stuff in the PowerPoints. I want to give you guys in-game thought processes, show you guys cool spots that come up as well that are not. I don't, I don't have time just to like make slides for indefinitely and go through because it would take 60 years. In Zoom, it just takes like six seconds and you can play a spot like that. So that's why there's so much live play in this series, if you're wondering. Okay, so on to the vacuum turn barrel factors then. There are some factors that make turn barreling as a bluff more favorable in a vacuum. Not to say that um, these factors mean that you always, when present, that you always have to bluff with every part of your range. But they do make bluffing with certain parts of your range higher EV or all parts of your range higher EV in a vacuum, which probably does make Hero more inclined to have a bluff heavy range and exploitative strategy based on the nature of the situation as long as he has a, enough of a reason to want to do that against Villain. 
So here are the plus factors. Hero's range improves on the turn card. This is good for a couple of reasons. One, turn cards on which your range improves are normally scary. So on a kind of level one thinking basis, level zero being I have Jax, Jax is a good hand, level one being villain could have Jax, Jax is a good hand. Um, on a level one basis, villain may think, oh, that king turn is bad, he might have ace king, I might have to fold now. Even fish fold on like ace and king turns, because guess what? You know, hero always has ace king, that's what they always put hero on. So, um, there are situations where even fish will fold if the turn is like good enough for hero's range, i.e. scary enough. And a reg will have a more sophisticated understanding of what turn cards are good for your range. A reg will see that on when you call king queen six and the turn's a ten, that you're actually very rarely folding your range there because you either make two pairs straight or a pair plus draw. So it just you pick up so much equity that you're probably not going to be folding too many turn bits. So they may um, correctly exploitatively underbluff that turn card because they think that you are just not folding, you're un underfolding your range as a result of the board texture, and that may indeed be the case. Sometimes, as you'll recall from earlier episodes, the mere run out of the texture can cause a player to be unbalanced, and rightly so. So we're not always forced to be balanced on every run out and every texture ever. Sometimes we're just skewed in such a way that we don't have much value or many hands we want to fold or many hands we want to call and that kind of thing. And we just have to kind of deal with that sometimes. Not always. Another advantage, the another good factor for barreling the turn is when villain's range does not improve on the turn card. Um, I just gave you an example where it did. You know, he calls flop on king queen x, the turn's a 10. He makes all that other equity. It's not really a good card for us then to bluff with bad equity ourselves or to over bluff or anything like that. It's not going to be good for us to barrel villain on that run out. Um, if his range, however, does not improve, like he calls the flop blind versus blind on 8 3 3 and the turn is like a random 6, um, this is a fairly good card for us to barrel, contrary to what a lot of people would have said in conventional poker wisdom. People would say back in the day when everyone was super fit or fold on the flop, like he won't fold all his pocket pairs, don't bother barreling the 6. Well, Villain doesn't actually have that many pocket pairs if he's playing this spot properly blind versus blind. He should be flatting your flop c-bet in position really, really wide and with most mostly with hands that are not pocket pairs that are just two high cards, back their flush draws, that kind of thing. Um, and so on this flop of like 4-4 four, four deuce when you get the 8 turn, um, it's actually a fine turn card for you just to go ahead and keep applying pressure with lots of your range. If the turn is an ace, however, that actually hits a lot more of Villain's range than the 8 does and that's actually a much, much worse card for you to barrel on these days contrary to what was the case in 1946, or whenever online poker first came out. I think it was just after World War II that they made poker stars. Hero has some equity. Um, this is always important, because when you have equity, you need less fold equity. The two are inversely proportionate, or at least the requirements of the two are inversely proportionate. If I have a flush draw, and I bluff you on the turn, and you call me, you don't need. I don't need you to fold that often because I reason that you know 19% of the time or whatever I'm going to get there, I'm going to make the best hand in the river and then I'm going to go ahead and make a value bet and get paid off more. So in the branch of the EV tree where you call me, it's not so desolate and bleak as it is when I have like an under pair and have two outs to improve against your top pair. So having equity always makes it more plus EV to barrel in a vacuum. Hero has prospects to bluff many river cards. Um, this is, take this with a pinch of salt, against some villains it's not really a factor because they may just not fold. A villain is a crazy aggro fish running 58-40 and gets to the the river with just a bunch of like decent one pair of hands that he doesn't care to fold even on flushy straighty runouts or overcard runouts. Then this isn't a factor, but it is a factor against someone who's thinking, especially like tighter players who will frequently overfold their range on bad rivers, who will not bluff catch enough, and that might be fine against their population as the population doesn't always triple barrel the river enough. Um, but if you think that you're against a villain who just can fold, is capable of making like folds or even overfolding their range on the river, um, the more scary rivers that make them do that to a greater extent that there are in the deck, the higher EV your turn bluff is likely to be. There are just more branches in the there are more branches in the main sub branches, if you like, in the main branch where you get called on the turn that lead to you winning the pot on the river. So you're therefore the EV of your turn bet is higher again. Villain is a player type who can fold. This is more of a kind of requirement than it is like a positive factor, but I guess it is both. Um, villain needs to be someone who's not just a drooling maniac. If a fish like snap calls and he's like 88, 10, and he's just like snap call on the flop, like he's just probably folding the turn about 4% of the time or less. Um, don't bother bluffing him, just realise your equity, just ping off that 19% equity, try and make your flush and get a big bet in there and then don't like blow pots with 
you know, equ with like losing equity in the hand that's gonna with, with a hand that's gonna lose most of the time at showdown if villain is never ever folding. Like it doesn't matter how good these other factors are, if villain is not gonna fold on the turn and not on the river either, then you just need you can't really be bluffing if he's like folding none of his range on the turn because he's a fish and he's called your seabelt on like eight, seven, six and he's just always calling the turn, and you just know this, then just don't bother bluffing the turn. You have a gut shot, check. Just check fold. Like, you might get a free card, you might not, but it's better than piling the two-thirds pot size bet into the middle with no fold equity at all, and very little prospect of winning the hand on the river. Those were positive factors, and with positive factors comes a happy face. That's all I have to say on that point. Here are some negative factors. Um, villain's a stationy fishy player. This is obviously just terrible because he's not going to fold. We don't have the aforementioned very important fold equity. When you're bluffing, fold equity is quite important. Like I've had really beginner students before who would fire a bluff and I'd say, do you think you have much fold equity here? And they'd say, no. I'd say, so why did you decide to bluff villain? And I'll say, because my hand can't win otherwise. That's not a reason to bet if you have no fold equity. It's like me saying, um, say I got like locked in my house um, and I had no way out of my house and I jumped through the window and like lacerated my face and then fell two stories and like broke lots of bones. Then in the hospital they said to me, why did you jump out of the window? And I said, well, my girlfriend had locked me in my house or something and I had no way out until the next day when she got back from work or like I wasn't going to get out of my house for a few hours or something so I jumped out the window. It's like just because there's no other way for you to do something doesn't mean that the way you choose is actually a good idea. It's the same here. Like, why bluff a station? Like, yes, you can't win the pot if you don't, but that doesn't make a good idea to bluff the station. Yes, I can't get out of the house unless I jump through the window and smash my face open, um, but it doesn't make a good idea to jump through the window, you know? Um, come on, like, common logic here, guys. Like, poker is, is a weird environment. Things are very different in the poker world than they are in life, but sometimes when you draw comparisons and you give a metaphor and an analogy for life, you can start to see just how absurd some poker logic is when you remove it from the cloudy realm of poker and put it in the more familiar, transparent realm of life. Like, no one would do that jump out the window thing unless they were very mentally disturbed, and no one would do the whole bluff the fish thing in poker unless they had a bad mental game and a bad thought process, which, obviously, they might have, because in poker, we've not evolved... I'm going on such a rant here, but I love these rants. We haven't evolved to um, know that we shouldn't bluff fish. That wasn't very imperative in the Stone Age, that we shouldn't bluff fish to get by. We didn't really play poker back then, or at least if we did, it was with like different shaped stones and bits of grass. Um, so, yeah, we have evolved to know that you shouldn't jump through glass and cause yourself severe harm. So that's kind of why we don't do that. But it will come in time. You'll grow a poker um, kind of almost as if you've got like a kind of... Um, I guess it's almost like an evolutionary makeup in poker, like the more you play, you just get these really ingrained habits where you just know you shouldn't do something because it's really, really bad for you. It's a bit like the survival instinct, I suppose. It's like a pseudo-survival instinct. Anyway, um, if villain is overly fit or fold on the flop, this can actually be a bad thing for barreling the turn. And the reason for this is that very fit or fold flop villains will have a strong range when they get to the turn. If he's folding 70% to a C-bet, he's only getting to the turn with the top 30% of hands that he can flop, and most of those are like top pair and stuff like that, so you don't really want to go ahead and start over bluffing Villain on the turn. He is extremely unbalanced in how much, how little he floats the flop or calls a flop light, so the way you deal with that, the way you exploitatively kill that is just by one and dunning the flop and giving up the turn. So if Villain is really, really tight and you say, oh, but look, he's got such a high fold to see, but I should just keep bluffing him. No, because he's already done the narrowing of his range. A range can't narrow infinitely. It has to stop narrowing somewhere as hands just become concentratedly good. So you can't just keep barreling into like an already very narrow range. It's like when the net who has an 80% fold to 3-bet calls your 3-bet, you should probably be careful on these boards that do well for his range and just check fold when you don't have equity. It's bad when Hero has reasonable showdown value. I don't understand like why so many people struggle with this concept. Like, and I don't mean that in like a bitchy way, like, why are you guys so dumb? Why don't you get this? I just mean like, this is one of the most misapplied things I've ever come across in any kind of teaching I've ever seen in anything in the world, is people that don't understand showdown value. Like, showdown value is really important because when you're bluffing, you are trying to make a decision, you're making a choice to do something other than showing your hand down, okay? And the reason you're doing that is because you think that there's a big difference in EV, usually, um, or a difference in EV between bluffing and showing your hand down. Namely, you think that bluffing is higher EV than showing your hand down. 
Now, if your hand beats all the hands that fold, it's not. Because when you get to showdown, you're going to win the pot anyway if Villain would have folded to your turn bet, right? Most of the time, of course, I'm oversimplifying a little bit here. Hands can realise equity and suck out and stuff, but that's a different reason. That's like protection we're getting into there. So if we get to showdown um, against a hand that would have folded to our turn bet, we're probably going to win the pot, like the vast, vast majority of the time anyway. And if we get to showdown against a hand that beats us, and it doesn't bet when we just save a bet. So oftentimes betting with showdown value as a bluff just makes very little sense unless that showdown value is like really hardly ever gonna win, in which case it's not really showdown value at all. Um, but so many of my students will just be like, it'll be like the flop will be like ace, jack, six, and they'll bet the flop with like queen, jack, which is probably just a categorical error in the first place. And then they'll get to the turn and they'll just bet again. And I'll be like, why did you bet your second pair of jacks on the turn? And they'll say, um, because I want to like represent the ace. And it's like, again, this is the kind of reasoning that just doesn't, it doesn't work because in EV terms, which is the thing we care about, like representing the ace means nothing. It's just a saying. It's just some, it's just words that have come out of your mouth. It doesn't mean anything really. Um, yeah, villain might think you have an ace. It doesn't mean he's going to fold his ace. Um, it doesn't mean he's going to fold enough better hands to make betting better than checking. It's just not the case um, unless you've got some ridiculous read that he folds like most of his aces on the turn on ace-jack-x, which is just very, very rare and unlikely. So when you have showdown value, you really need to think of it in terms of this makes the alternative to bluffing really good, and therefore it means that bluffing is probably worse than that, or at least not much better than that. So if you want a balanced betting range, which we're going to get to in the next couple of slides, you don't want to use loads of hands with showdown value, because even if they are gaining EV by betting, which they may not be because they win at showdown so much anyway, um, but even if they are gaining EV by betting, they'll be gaining much, much less EV than Total Air will. Total Air never wins at Showdown. It has a very poor EV of going to Showdown, whereas when it bets, if it's profitable and you're getting enough folds, then it's going to gain a lot of EV by betting. So when you fill out your balance range on the turn with bets and checks and stuff, make sure that your bets and your bluffing part of your bets specifically um, favours hands without showdown value first and foremost. Hands with equity and without showdown value, these are the optimal hands to bet because they will improve sometimes, but the majority of the time on the river, if you don't try and win the pot with them, they're going to lose. And if you do try and win the pot with them and you get there, you can win an even bigger bet. Like they, they make a lot of sense to bet at the turn. Like middle pair jacks does not. Don't use reasons like, um, I'm only stressing this so much because it's like such a ridiculously common leak that I see that I just want to like solve it once and for all. I want to like hammer it into the ground so it never shows its ugly head ever again. Um, betting second pair in the turn to rep the ace or to bully villain or to be aggressive or to keep the betting lead, these are all just garbage reasons. Um, they're just nonsense when it comes to EV. They have nothing to do with EV unless you have a read specifically that you know villain thinks these things or will think these things and play his range very unbalanced because of it. It's a horrible attempt at a good balance strategy to bet mediocre showdown value on the turn. It's just fundamentally flawed. Hero has a bad image. If your image is really bad, people will start playing unbalanced against you. They'll start underfolding their range, and that means that you need to start under bluffing. So whenever someone's overcalling their range on the turn, they're defending more of their range than is balanced, you need to adjust to that by value betting more of your range than is balanced. And we're about to move on to the next slide where we'll talk about how much of your range that is actually going to be and how we can form it. So those were bad factors, so this is a sad face. I don't know why I put those faces in. I think I was just like disturbed by the amount of emptiness on the slide and wanted to do something a bit more fun and aesthetically pleasing. Imagine your face looked like that, like you walked down the street and you went to the shop and you had this face and the cashier looked up to serve you and then there would just be this recoiled look of, oh my God, like every time. And it would be really hurtful actually. So, you know, try and be sensitive to people who have this kind of mouth. I'm in a really wacky mood today, guys, so I'm just going off on random rants. I just feel that way. It's Friday. It's my weekend. I get to play Bridge tonight, which is like my favorite game in the world, so kind of happy about that. Here's a model um, and the random blue box that didn't um, didn't join the the slide at the right time. It had a mind of its own. Um, in this model, Hero C bets the flop and then reaches the turn. But what does Hero have? It doesn't matter. It's just a model. Don't worry about it. He wants to make a nine big blind bet into a pot of 14 on the turn. This is roughly a two thirds pot size bet. How can he balance his range? Okay, so remember that when we're balancing and we're making villain indifferent to doing things against us, we want to look at things from villain's point of view first 
and we want to see, given our bet size, how much equity would the villain need roughly to call, and let's give him exactly that amount so that he breaks even, not a penny more or less, roughly speaking, um, and therefore any adjustment by villain, like overcalling his range on the turn or undercalling his range on the turn, will not have any effect on us. This, again, is the nuts and bolts of, of balance, just to reiterate that. Well, villain's required equity, or RE as I call it in my book, The Grinder's Manual, which will be out in a few weeks, is 9 divided by 9 plus 23. This is amount to call, which is 9, divided by amount to call plus total pot. But wait, the total pot's 14, not 23. No, it's not. The total pot is the pot that appears on your screen after villain has bet at you when you're the caller here facing this bet. So it's not 14. 14 is what the pot was on the turn before villain bet. The pot on the turn now is 23. Amount to call is not in the pot yet. That's not villain's bet. That's your bet that's going to come from your from your stack. So what you're doing is you're dividing your bet by your bet plus that's not in the pot yet by everything that's in the pot, including villain's bet. Okay, this is how you work out required equity. Or you can learn a milestone table, like two-thirds pot equals 28%, half pot equals 25%, pot size equals 33%, empty pot equals 50%, this kind of thing. So if this were the river, this would be totally true. This 25% RE required equity would be the actual amount that villain would need of equity in order to call and break even. Um, so he would, so Hero would want 28% of his reigns to lose to Villain's Bluff Catchers and the rest to beat Villain's Bluff Catchers. In other words, Hero would want 62% of his reigns to be value and 28% of his reigns to be bluffs. Is that right? No. 72% of his reigns to be value. Man, my math is just like non-existent, it seems today. 72% of his range would be value and 28% of his range would be bluffs. I just added those up and got 90 somehow. Um, so... That's not the case though, because we are not on the river. This is not what I'd call an end of action spot. This is what I would call an open action spot. The difference is that in an end of action spot, there will be no more action in the hand and thus we can simplify quite easily. We can say, all right, we're actually at the river. We know that when we call, we will get to show down immediately. There will be no more fold equity, realization of equity, implied odds realization, um, bad future cards, anything like that. Just none of that can happen. We're at the end of the hand. Here we're not at the end of the hand and that means that you can't oversimplify and say I just that villain needs 28% equity to call here because it's not actually true. He's going to need more than that because if he calls every hand with 28% equity here, he's not going to do very well because our bluffs have equity. He's not beating all of our bluffs here. So if he calls a hand with that's like a head 28% of the time or, okay, how do I put this? Like, if he calls here, um, with the middle of his range, when we've structured our range so that the middle of his range has 28% equity, um, it's not going to be great for him. Because when we realise equity, we get implied odds. And we'll be able to bet again on the river versus his bluff catchers, and he'll need to decide if he's calling there. If he does, he'll lose even more money when we get there. So our, our range can improve and can extract future money from him on the next street. That's really important. Secondly, Hero can bluff future streets too. So not all of villain's showdown value is going to be realisable for this price. He can say, okay, I'm calling my whole range in the river. He can go back to like 2008 and say, if I call turn, I must call river because he's brain dead and doesn't know how to think about poker. He can think that if he wants and he can call his whole range in the river. It still doesn't mean that he's breaking even when he calls with a hand with 28% equity on the turn. It's just not the case because then he has to put in more money on the river, getting worse pot odds. If you look at the combination of, of Hero's turn bet and his river bet added together, and look at the price that that gives Villain to call both those bets at once, that's going to be considerably worse than the price for just calling the turn here. So it's a big mistake for Villain just to say, I have enough equity, I meet RE, I call, because he will face another bet on the river, sometimes with a hand that's actually improved. So this is problematic for Villain. He needs more than 28% here, clearly, to call the turn bet. So we need to actually have more bluffs in our range so that he has um, more equity when he calls, basically against our range. We want to give him more equity because he needs more equity. If he needed less equity, we'd give him less equity. We're trying to give him exactly as much equity as he needs to break even on a call. So the turn balance rule, which is a vague thing that I've come up with, it's not necessarily exactly correct, is that villain will need 10 to 20% more than RE required equity, depending on the board texture and how much equity Hero's bluffing range has. So the more equity, like we can say our range is, con is constituted you know, like 72 to 28 bluffs to value, but it's not that simple because our bluffs have different degrees of equity. If our bluffs are on like a really dry texture where they have very minimal equity, then it's not going to be too bad for a villain. He's only going to need slightly more than his required equity to call as long as he plays the river okay. 
Um, but if it's a board that's quite wet and all our bluffs have like nine outs and stuff like that, then of course he can't just call here because we have a ratio of 72 value to 28 bluffs because our bluffs have so much equity, they're not really pure bluffs. Um, our range is then way more equity heavy and he's going to need more equity consequently to call against it. So this is a benchmark rule. He'll need 10 to 20% more than RE depending on the board texture. Um, this is what we're going to use for the turn just to simplify. Like we're not, we're humans, you know, we need like simplifications that we can use in game. We're not going to go into depth here and calculate exactly how much we should adjust this by because for one, it's almost impossible to know exactly what that is because there's so many factors on the next street. When you're in an open action spot where there's still action to come, there's just so many things to consider here. You could probably, if I was better at um, like this kind of poker math and had researched it more extensively, I could probably like spend an hour and go through and actually try and get some really accurate estimate about how much more exactly villain would need on a certain board texture. But it's kind of not really worth the while, to be honest. The purposes of this series are to make you a better Zoom player, and that would that's going to be orchestrated by me actually doing a bunch of examples and showing you how to practically use this stuff in-game and not just going into super theoretical land where it's not going to be very applicable. So we're just going to use the 10 to 20% rule. On drier boards, we'll need closer to 10% extra. He'll need closer to 10% extra, so we can have closer to 10% more bluffs in our range. On wetter boards, he'll need closer to 20%, and we can, or even more on really wet boards where we just don't have much pure air, um, and we're going to need more bluffs in our range as a result, more non-value hands, if you like. Bluffs is a bit of a problematic word because you can see here that I'm using it to cover all hands that aren't made yet, and a lot of those do have a lot of equity and they're more in the semi-bluff camp, but just take it to mean non-value hands for now. Hands are behind when called. So on average, Hero should bluff around 40 to 45% of his turn betting range with two-thirds pot sizing. Why? Well, because this is 28%. This is how many, many bluffs we would have if this were the river. Because it's not, we're using the turn balance rule to adjust our ratio to ac accommodate for the fact that villain needs more equity to call due to these two things here. And therefore, we're adding around sort of 12, 15%, um, 17%, whatever, onto this 28%. I'm just saying 40 to 45 as a rough ballpark area. By the way, it's not really that important if you if your range is slightly unbalanced. It's not going to be a huge deal. It's not going to translate to too much information being given away or re-exploitation re -exploitation? Re -exploitation happening on villain's part. So being slightly, slightly unbalanced is not really too big of a problem. As long as we aim at balance roughly and we get pretty damn close to it, that's really all that we can ask to do in-game for now. Like That's fine. That's absolutely perfect aim. So let's take an example hand and try and put all this into action. If you found that last slide really confusing and like it was really fast paced, it was, and I've been building up and making this, I've been explaining things and hand holding less and less as the series has gone on, that's intentional. But this is a video, you can always go back, like if you're my student, you might say, sorry, can we go over that again? I'd say, yeah, sure, no worries. You can go back and actually watch that slide again. Just make sure you really understand what's going on there theoretically before you look at this example hand, okay? So I'm going to give you a second now to go back, watch that again if you're in any way unsure about it. Definitely recommend you do that. Okay, I'll assume that you're happy with the math and the theory there and the rough approximation of why we're adding that 10 to 20% rule onto our theory. And we're going to look at an example where hero raises to two big blinds on the button with 9 of spades and big blind calls. The flop comes down. Check 6-3. Rainbow. A flop on which I would be inclined to bet my whole range for a small, so that's what Hero does, because Hero is basically me. Um, and Big Blind calls the two Big Blind C-bet. We covered this before, when you're in position, you can sort of just have free reign to C-bet everything really small. It's a good balance strategy that you can then split up on later streets, so I won't go into that again now. Watch the last episode if you want to seek further clarification on why that's a good idea, or why it might not be a good idea out of position. Turns of five of clubs, pretty much one of the blankest of the blank turns in the deck, um, but it does give us a gut shot. So the question now is, should Hero bet, assuming he has no reason, to play exploitatively? So that means we're looking at a balance strategy, and we're going to assume that we're going to use our two-thirds pot size turn sizing. It's generally a good size to use on the turn. It gets fold equity, it gets value, it builds pots, it applies pressure. Um, it's a better size than like half potting the turn. 
some tournament players when they first switch to online six minutes cash will just undersize on the later streets because they're used to like protecting their stack more in a tournament or whatnot. Um, here you definitely want to bet two thirds pot or something like that. It's a fine turn size. So, how big is the pot on the turn is the first question. Well, it's going to be eight point five minus rake, so probably like eight big blinds or something. So here is going to be about five fifty, about two thirds pot. Um, and so, is that five? Is that two thirds pot? I think it's a bit extra, but whatever. So here is going to be two thirds pot anyway. Whatever that is, two thirds of eight. Let's just find out. I'm curious. Yeah, five point twenty eight. So five fifty was a bit bigger. So here about five dollars and twenty eight cents, or five point two eight BBs here. Types it in like one of those really annoying regs that you want to slap in the face for having really specific sizing. Because that's the kind of guy hero is. Because hero is me, and I do that shit sometimes. I tend to stick the multiples of five when I'm above like fifty no limit. Um, yeah, but uh, like five no five and L, I'll bet like a dollar eleven and stuff like that. Anyway, um, so should he bet his nine eight spades here? Is this a good part of hero's range for him to bluff with? And how much of his range does it equate to bluffing? And how much of Hero's range should he bluff here to be balanced? Well, we said 28% was our core required equity for Villain here when we bet two-thirds pot in the last slide. But we're going to adjust that. But the board is pretty dry, so actually we can't adjust that by too much here. So we need to be careful that we're not bluffing loads here because we don't have that much equity when we bluff. And Villain will be somewhere relatively near to his required equity. We're going to increase it by only about 12% here and say that we therefore need to bluff 40% of the time when we bet this turn. So the question is, how much value do we then have in our range? Well, I would value at this turn in position here with probably something like Queen, Jack, and better. It may be even Jack, 10, and better. Probably Queen, Jack, and better. Um, giving me 36 combos of Jack X. Um, there's 12 of each, four by three, basically, for all the, the Jack X combos of Queen, Jack, plus. So we have 36 combos of that. Um, and then I'm going to have my sets, threes, sixes, and fives, which are another nine combos, making me 45 combos. Then I'm going to have queens through aces, which is another 18, making me 63 combos. So I'm at 63. I've got quite a lot of value hands here. I probably have some two pair too, like six, five suited, um, maybe five, three suited for another sort of four combo. So say I've got about 72 value combos in my range here, which seems reasonable. That would mean that I want 40% of my range to be bluffs, right? So I want this kind of six to four ratio, a three to two ratio, if you like. So what I'm gonna to need to do then is, I've got 72 value, and I want that to only be like 40% of my range. So I'm gonna divide this by three, and I'm gonna times it by two, and this is how many bluffs I need, 48 bluffs. So that three to two ratio, 60 to 40. So, I just forgot the number, 48. So 48 bluffs, um, what suitable bluffs do I have? What are my best bluffs to start with? Well, I have no flush draws, right? So my best bluffs here are literally like open and straight draws. So something with a four in it or like seven, eight. Seven, eight could be 16 combos if I've got all of it. Okay, done, check those off. Um, then I've got like stuff with four in it, like ace four suited, king four suited, queen four suited, three four suited, six four suited. No, that's showdown value, can't use that. Um, so these 4x hands, suited 4x, are going to be what if I have ace, say I have queen 4 through to ace 4 suited, and then, um, yeah, ace, yeah, that's it really, all the other ones have a pair of some sort. So that would be another 12. So you can see here that I am going to have to use gut shots, I don't have enough open and straight draws here to fill out the 48, so what better hand than the, the nut gut shot to use here, 9 8 suited. I'm going to go ahead and bluff it, and I can work that out without knowing exactly what my bluffing range is. That's pretty difficult to do in-game, but this is the kind of thing that if you do it more and more, you become better and better at having a balanced strategy in-game. And so I know that this is now a bet, because I, to be balanced, I need to bet a hand that's suitable, and so Hero should bet this hand. Okay, so a lot to take in there um, today. I definitely recommend going back and watching over this video again if you're confused about any of this, about the procedure the balance and what's going on. Still haven't really had any feedback about this video. Forums are a bit dead. Are you liking it? Is it okay? Can you follow it? Is the pace all right? You know, are you learning from it? I hope that you are because I'm putting a bunch of effort into these slides and stuff and just trying to make this as comprehensive as possible about Zoom. So, so that was that and there's the carrot man again just for fun and let's do some live play now.
I like to make them dissolve. I just like figured out that I could do that, these exit effects today. So I just wanted to see it like one more time. I'm gonna have them on screen as well while we play a little bit of poker. So let's play for a while, bring up our recorder again so we can know how long our short session should be. These are just quick sessions of 15 minutes or so just for a little bit of fun and to talk some more zoom logic about different spots that come up. And I won't go over like really ridiculously standard things like folding in any of these spots that are going on right now because um, they're all just very standard folds. And fast folds, again, the quicker you fast fold, I said this last week, I think, quicker that you fast fold, the more money you make per hour if you're a winning player. So it's a good idea to fast fold quite a lot. Um, here, I don't know, this could be a fish, this could be a fish. Our position is really bad, though. I don't think this is profitable. From the big blind, it would definitely be a call. I think from the small blind, it's probably not with queen five suited despite the amazing pot odds. There's a little bit of reverse implied as well when you do flip like two pair or trips or flush, there is some reverse implied odds there. Not loads, but some. Obviously, I don't mean like when you flop a dominated pair of queens because you're not going to put a lot of money with that into the pot with that anyway. But when you do flop something big, you know, out of position, um, it's not that amazing. The implied odds there are not as good as they look. Um, King nine here is probably, this is like the very bottom of my hijack range. I have better hands I can 4-bet, so it's just a fold to the 3-bet out of position here. Um, I'm going to just fold there because I do have regs ahead of me that look quite squeezy. I do want to play more pots with the fish. Um, small line is really tight. I don't know about the button. This is obviously too wide of a cutoff range to really defend well if people are actually 3 betting me a lot. But I've got an unknown button and a tight small blind, so I just think like I can get away with being exploitatively a bit wide there on the cutoff. Um, Ace 3 here has the backdoor flush, or has backdoor straight draw. It's also like a range bettable flop cutoff against big blind, I think. So I'm just going to go ahead and bet like 125 here. Bet slightly less than half pot with my whole range. It's close to not being a range bet because it's like semi semi wet, but it's not wet enough for that to really be the case. And now, perfect situation for our theory today. Where am I on my range? Well, how much do I need to? I need this board's quite wet, so I think actually here I want closer to a 50 50 ratio of plus to value due to all the equity my bluffs have. So, value combos here are going to be quite a lot. They're going to be again like 80 or something like that if I had to estimate. And I think that therefore I'm gonna need like 80 bluff combos, so I'm gonna need more than just flush draws. I don't I can't flesh this out with just flush draws, so I'm gonna go ahead and bet my ace three here um as well. I think it's gonna qualify as a turn bluff. Probably not gonna bet it on the river because it's just not great. The ace of hearts blocks flush draws my opponent kind of missed with and stuff like that. Um and ace does have some tiny amount of showdown value on that river. I will bet it though because a lot of my range just improved, like all my diamond draws improved, all my king x got there, um, so I think I can definitely make a relatively small-ish um, river value bet um, bluff here with this part of my range, I think it's fine, but I wouldn't bet like all rivers there, it's just a particularly good one where my range improves a lot, so it's going to be fine to bet with that part of it. Notice I don't remark on the fact that Villain folded there. The reason for that is that it has nothing to do with how good my bluff is. Like, lesser instructors or lesser, um, less experienced players, I should say, might say something like, oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have bluffed there, like, when they get called, just for no reason other than results told them. So, and that's, you've got to be very careful with that, you know, it's not a good way to look at things at all. Um, back to our straight draw here is operational and villain is a fish so what does that even mean operational so i think i'm just gonna like see bet small and expect to get enough folds basically with my queen seven um i'm gonna 3x here with the silver star and the big blind should be fine get a bit more money into the pot and leading flops like this is not really a great idea it's just gonna hit villain's limping range okay and i have like the worst equity possible so we'll check fold there and clear c bet i think with the gut shot here I think it's also just another spot against a fish well bet close to my whole range. I've really started to tone my seabet sizing down in recent months because I used to just be barreling way too wide. Um, this spot is like not ideal, but I, the king does miss villain's range a lot. I'm just, just going to make a big bet and expect him to fold a bunch here. Fold enough probably, and I do have a gut shot if called. Don't bluff fish as a general rule is a good one, but there are definitely times when like you get a really good card, like a big over card that's also a flush card that's just going to make him fold a lot of his range probably anyway. Um, fish just think in those terms, they like to put you on over cards and flushes. These are the two types of turns that they fold on, so I definitely think it's fine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just make a small c-bet here. There are some over cards with like no spade that just fold right away. I do have a gut shot, it's definitely marginal. I'm just going to give up on the ace because a lot of his range can get there now. 
and I mean there are some hands I can make fold here I can pair without a spade or whatever he does check pretty quickly um, so I think it's okay to bet like 350 here I don't need that much fold equity to do it so that's probably fine um, I just fold 10 out of the small line they're not really going to have the best price to mine out of position when the guy's not even fully stacked so implied odds suffer ace queen I think I can just call this bot rather than turning ace queen off into a bluff it doesn't play amazing multi way but it's definitely callable whereas I'd rather bluff like king queen and ace jack off which probably aren't callable 825 is an insanely large squeeze I'm going to take that to be a weaker player but I don't know it could just be some net that's like oh my god have kings don't want action who knows Go fold anyway, I just don't think this is like likely to be balanced when it's this huge a size. I think it's quite likely to just be like a value range. Did we just have aces and nothing good happened? It's a shame. I saw aces and I didn't, so yeah. Oh well. So we can just go ahead and fold here pretty happily, because even if we do call and bink like a pair, I'm far from thrilled due to domination from kings plus when it's a queen, and from ace king when it's an ace. Ace Queen offsuit, let's try again. If at first you don't succeed, try to get into another pot with Ace Queen offsuit. Um, close spot, men open's probably good. It defends against the small blind squeezing um three betting me loads, which he might do. He seems active so far. But also like gets me into a pot with the fish. I would normally like the three X to get into a bigger pot with the fish, but then the small blind gets more profitable three bets, which is not not so great. Easy call here with Ace Jack, just go three way, got relative position on got position on the small blind which is fine giving up here and I think just making a small ish C bet would have been good if I hadn't timed down there just to protect my equity possibly turn my hand into a bluff on later streets as well it's pretty weak so that check's not very good at all and now I have to fold which sucks but yeah that's why you don't want to time down so yeah I mean Ace Jack we call here he I think flop is probably a call like we have the back there flush draw and very good showdown value the fish will miss his flop most of the time He's going to give up there a lot. I don't want to bluff the fish, however. Um, I didn't want the fish to call me. Call behind there. I'd rather, like, he bet so, so small. Oh, my God. Do we have odds to draw here? Depends how often we're actually good when we get there. I think we do have to call this turn. Like, I think an ace or a jack does make us the best hand more often than not. And we could even win with ace high occasionally. It's not happy, though, certainly. Oh, wow. You just play kings like a huge net. Great. That's just terrible. That's really terrible. Like you can't stop betting there against a the fish. Like what are you afraid of? Just sitting monsters under the bed kind of thing, I suppose. Pretty bad. Um that's the moment when I look around, it's like one of my students or like a grand school member or some something like that. Um I'm just gonna bet most of my range, I guess, or all of my range on this King 7 4 board to start with, and then start splitting it up into some check calls, check folds, etc. Um aces I think should just be a bet, bet, bet. Because I don't block any king x, whereas when I have like king queen, I'm way more likely to check call the turn, or even ace king, because I do block the hands that can call me. And I'm just gonna bet nice and big here, because a bunch of my draws have missed, and I just want to polarize my range right up. And villains a silver star, who's probably not falling top pair. Wow, great! You gotta love it when you get min raise on the river, and you just beat always. It's not even a min raise; it's like a power min raise. Um, ah, oh, it sucks. Like, he could be overplaying king ten. It's possible. I hate this. He could have King-10 though, yeah he's usually going to have like a boat, I don't know, I mean I need like 20%, less than 20% equity to call, if I didn't think he could be overplaying King-10 to get value from like Ace-King, i definitely fold there, but I think just the fact that that board texture makes that a possibility makes me want to call, but I do hate it, it's like a very much a crying call, I expect to lose most of the time. Why do you call if you expect to lose most of the time characters, because I only need, I need to like win very rarely to call, for calling to be better than folding, basically, I expect to win very rarely, but... It's kind of the way it goes. Um, ace five, wheel aces are pretty much good enough to flat there. Range checking the turn. My range is weaker than his. I'm just going to let him do the betting, and I'll just make a river bet for value, and I balance up all my bluffs. And he folds. I don't really think he should be just checking down and folding there. I think he should be betting at some point with almost everything in his range. To be honest. Yeah, like when you get power men raised on the river by a fish, like you're just beat when you have top pair. Like I could maybe have even folded that spot. I just thought like. The King-10 is a fair amount of combinations um, if it's in there, and that's the problem. Because the sets are only three combos each, and it's actually the fact that four rolls off. Okay, you could have four X as well. Maybe that gives him a whole new sprouting of, like, now improved trips. Um, I don't know. It might be ambitious to call that river. It may be. 
I'm just doing what I said I should do, like looking up at it in hindsight and being like, I lost, maybe I should have folded. But I don't know how big up, how often people do raise King 10 there, like how much they, I think they do it quite a bit because they do put me on Ace King and King Queen and stuff like that and they raise their King 10 for value. So having Aces there is certainly like much closer to a call than Ace King is. Ace King is not a call for sure, but Aces with the top two pair probably, probably is okay, I think. Again, just range betting like a really dry board here that should... He is in the small blind though, so maybe I should like pick some give-ups there. Um, I'm going to just cold call this 3-bet with the Ace-King. I'm not super happy about it because it, it comes small blind against under the gun. I'd be much happier about it if it was like a later position, then I would 4-bet call off the hand and balance 4-bet bluffs. But I'm not going to have a 4-bet bluffing range in this spot because I feel like people just don't bluff enough here, especially against a non-full stack possible recreational player. Um, when he starts checking at me, I think I should just go for three streaks. I think my hand's probably good enough um, to do that. I don't know how thin this is, actually. It might be, it may be that I should check at some point. I don't know. And if I am checking at some point, maybe that should be flop. It's a weird spot. I'm not really used to playing um, these kind of situations. Now the turn is a clear check because we have, like, the second up flush draw, which we would loathe to get raised off of. Um, we have showdown value here. Our hand has got weaker. Um, it's a clear check and probably checking most rivers as well. Yeah, this river is just awful now. Like queens beats us, jacks beats us. It's, we're just going to lose here. The board run out is amazing for villains range and terrible for ours. So we are now like very low down in our range and we're just going to fold many bets. And I don't think I should turn this hand into a bluff. Like what would I be trying to make him fold? Like a, like jacks or a set of queens or something. I think it's a bit far-fetched. So we'll just let him have it with a set of queens. That's fine. So yeah, we can range villain very accurately there because it's like a four bet pot and ranges are, are much narrower to start with. Um, we'll just fold here with ace queen off when the guy three bets the fish under the gun open. It's not going to be, there's not going to be a very profitable way of continuing there on table three. On table one, we go ahead and three bet a tight looking small blind. Normally I'd flat that hand blind versus blind, but I felt like given he's so tight, I'd just use the wheelness and the blockiness of it um, to go ahead and make a... 3-bit bluff instead, and I think it's an easy C-bet on this texture with almost anything. He's just going to miss it a lot. When he calls, I expect his range to be some, like he's queen and stuff like that, but a lot of pocket pairs. If I was playing this turn balanced, I would probably have too much equity to give up at this point. I'd probably have to bet even a hand this week. I do have some diamond draws, but I'm not going to play this balance. I'm actually going to under bluff because I feel like he has a lot of pocket pairs now that probably aren't folding. And if he checks his river, which he will mostly, we're going to bet it. Fairly small, like for value basically. If he bets river, it's kind of confusing and weird. Um, I don't have much air here, like I do have some bluffs that I could be reigniting, but I don't think I'm going to get paid off if I make a big bet. I think I should just, you know, treat this guy as like face value, fairly basic, because he's a 16-8. And just like smaller bets, easier to call, right? So let's just make a small bet and try and get called. There's not really much else to it. Got a value about the river though, for sure. Yeah, he folds, it's going to happen a lot. I could even bluff that size, I probably have a fair bit of fold equity bluffing that size. Ace 10 is like kind of close to checking on this texture, but I think the board's a little bit too wet for me to like it. Turns a clear check, and River is going to be probably a fold. Like, we have a lot better hands in this texture. He bets half pot. There aren't that many busted, completely busted draws, so I think I want to overfold my range in that river, and therefore I'm going to fold Ace 10. Like, if I wasn't overfolding, it would probably be a call for that. It would be a call for that sizing. I just feel like people don't have enough bluffs there for me to really care. So, yep. So finish off this video and then continue editing my book, which is not far from completion, but the editing is just taking an absolute shitload of time, longer than I thought. Everything's taken longer than I thought with this book, but we're on the road now to finishing it where we just have to finish the editing and then we're good. I'm going to get it out on Amazon for you guys. So please check it out on Amazon. I'll let you know when it comes up. I'll do a grinder school podcast about it. I'll do a carrot poker um, podcast about it as well. I flat here because it's efficient to blind to. I want to play some pots with them in position. It's just a good spot. And to the tiny C bet, of course, this is a call along with most of my range for that sizing. And turn is clearly a call as well because I'm just so far up in my range. When he C bets that small in the flop, um, I definitely want to so go ahead and make like a small bet. My range is super wide here, like a lot of it just wants to bet for protection, honestly. So making a small value sized, like value looking C bet, I guess, it's, or stab bet. I don't even think it looks that value me, honestly, these days. I think it's just a consistent size of my range. Like my range has a lot of weak stuff that wants to stab. It's a lot of marginal stuff that just wants to protect. I don't really want to check back and just let him see a river and then play some guessing games as to whether I should overcall or undercall my range on the river. 
I'd have to play balanced, and I think I'd just do better by betting everything on the turn there for small. Um, King Queen will just flat this against the cutoff open. And check all this flop. And we'll go ahead and click our sit out button. Um, flush turn, but that's okay. He's not gonna have many flush shots when he checks back normally. So that is all right with me. And in this spot here, we get three bets. So we've got a four bet call off with kings. He flats us, that's fine, whatever. Um, flop, I'm gonna check back this flop with my whole range. I don't really love it with a lot of my range. Um, I have like ace-king here that probably wants to check back and flake. What else am I four betting? Like bluffs that don't contain queens, they're just like ace x, king x. I can delete bet those. So I think it's a check back, let him bluff, that kind of thing. And um, queen nine, that's probably just about a fold. And um, we'll go ahead and just start betting now to get the money in basically. And we can do this with our ace x and king x that missed as well. Preferably a6 because that blocks ace queen, which is one of the hands we're most worried about there. We're not so worried about king queen um, calling our four bet. This is going to be a clear call for this sizing with a weaker player behind, even though we're in small blind. And we open under the gun here, and I'm going to check call king queen on this flop. It's not a flop I love, and I do want to check and range here out position, like a lot of stuff like jacks and 10x or whatever, so it's good to have a few stronger hands in there too. And when we get delayed see bet now, we'll start betting. I mean, I just like feel so comfortable now, like knowing how I'm playing my ranges because I've just done so much work on what those ranges should be, I guess. Like, I just feel a lot more comfortable than I used to. Um, I'm just going to make a small turn lead here on table two, try and get some, start getting some value. And here I think our hand's good enough to bet River as well. I think like Jack Nine is going to bet the flop most of the time if he ever has it. Um, club draws aren't a huge part of his range or anything, so it should be fine. And we can also balance that with air too that we gave up on the flop and then decide to bluff twice with, especially when we have like these clubs or something. Because it blocks the not flush, which is obviously the hand that we're most worried about him having when he gets the river that way. Um, Jack 10 here, gonna just see bet. I'm gonna see bet like two thirds pot here, I'm out of position, so I want to make it a little bigger. I have a lot of equity, well, not a lot of equity, but I have a sizable slice of equity I've called. Get some more pocket aces for fun. And again, have no action, not so fun. Jack nine, um, I'm gonna open it for now, it's the bottom of my opening range. If this guy proves to three bet a lot, I will start folding this hand line versus blind. Let's just check fold this flop with two undercards and no backdoor draws. It's just very much down there in my range. I don't really think I want to bet, but now I turn the gut shot, I'm going to probably just one and done stab this um, with Jack Nine with this part of my range here. Like under pairs and just random stuff can fold there. I might bet, I might bet twice actually with that hand. I think with a Jack, I should bet twice. With a 10, I should bet once on the turn actually. It's the best way to balance there. The reason for that is that a Jack blocks higher kicker pairs, whereas a 10 is weaker. So I have more fold equity. Um, no, let me think about this. I have more fold equity, yeah, I have more fold equity when he has more tens and I have the jack. I have less fold equity when he has more jacks because I have the ten. Therefore, I want to bluff when I have the jack and check the river when I have the ten. So it's just a way of like balancing my range, basically. Okay, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Um, be back next week for some more. May get some students on the show soon and do some different stuff as well. And yeah, please leave me some feedback. Let me know what you think. Ask me any questions or, or leave me any comments that you have. Alright guys, good luck at the tables, see you on the next one.